You may know her from the NBA Finals when Mike Breen gave her that shout out, but if you don't, you'll know her from her new book, Giannis, The Improbable Rise of an NBA MVP. Amir and Fader, thanks so much for being here. Right off the top, can you tell us like a crazy Giannis story that you think most NBA fans don't know? Yeah, I mean, I think people know that Atlanta had interest in Giannis, but they did not know about a secret meeting that I uncovered in Italy. There was this big camp and, and this big tournament and um, Giannis was obviously there and he was very much a question mark, but Atlanta was so serious about him. They arranged for him to meet up at this hotel basement and they, the lights were dark. It was like really shoddy. It wasn't even basement slash restaurant and it's Giannis and his agents and Atlanta officials and Giannis just really breaks down and just tears up and is like, if you draft me, like I'll give everything, you know? And all I want is for my family to come to America and my brothers to have education and do all these things. And the staffer is just blown away. You know, first of all, he's terrified that somebody's gonna find out about this secret meeting. Um, he's terrified that another GM is listening somewhere. And he feels like he got the biggest steal in the draft. Like here's this humble kid that wants nothing more than a chance to work hard in the NBA. So it is actually so painful to this day for Danny Ferry, the Hawks GM, that he missed out on Giannis, that it took me months to even get him to talk to me on the record because <laughs> it is still such a sore spot. <laughs> yeah, and I want to talk a little more about how you wrote the book later, but um, you know, one thing that blew my mind was that he almost quit after his rookie year. Like, how real was that? Because just now in your story, you talked about he brought up his brothers at that dinner, right? So family's that important to him. How close was he actually to quitting after his rookie season? Yeah, so that was one of the biggest reveals in my book through my reporting is that he was so lonely because his family couldn't get the proper visas to come to America and live with him and move there that he told Alex and Alex told me this. He said, you know, uh, Yana said, if you guys can't come to America, I'm going back to Greece. And um, Alex was really taken aback because obviously his brother was working so, so hard. I mean, Giannis was getting thrown around in the paint. He's putting hours into the weight room. You know, why do you want to throw away all that? But Giannis just like doesn't mean anything if you're not here with me. So it was very serious. Um, the family got denied twice in terms of their visas according to my reporting and had they not uh came over i don't know if Giannis would have stayed but he did stay i'm sure being on like a 15 win team didn't help right <laughs> he's not like loving life in the nba um but then jason kidd gets hired and yeah. honestly look reading the excerpt on the ringer <laughs> it was kind of like the jordan rules where like all these details come out about stuff behind the scenes that Jason Kidd probably, maybe, I don't even know, maybe he's cool with that stuff being out there, but it was so shocking to me how much of a jerk that he was. Like, you would think Jason Kidd, you know, Hall of Famer, he's a player's coach. Dude is anything but a player's coach, right? It's two, two ways people go. You're a player's coach and you're super cool and everyone likes you, or you're a player that can't get over that you're retired and you are super awful to be around because you are just devastated that your career's over. I think it's just one or two ways. Okay, and one anecdote, just to paint the picture for the people who haven't read it yet, is I couldn't believe this. A player didn't have an iPhone. <laughs> a player didn't have an iPhone, and they have um like the blue, I can't remember, is it blue or green text? The, the, it made it green because he had an Android. Okay, and so if you all have iPhones, they're blue text, and he like punished the player for not having an iPhone because he looked at it as a sign of team unity but it wasn't like a joke. Like it was serious yeah. punishment. Like that is so crazy to me. Um, do, this is sidetrack. Do you think Jason Kidd has like changed any now that he's gonna be a head coach again? I, I don't I don't know. You know, I have no idea about current Jason, but I know that I'll just tell you, I've interviewed 221 people for this book and you know, I have never ever had a situation where so many people asked me to go off the record um, when talking about Jason Kidd and I've done a lot of stories on a lot of other NBA coaches and players, but he is probably the most polarizing. Um, you know, it'd be easy to dismiss if it was just like somebody just yelling at you or harping 24 seven, but he's not a yeller. That's what makes this so complicated. It's these weird manipulative 
things that he's known for. And as I said in the excerpt, give him credit for how he developed Giannis and potentially could develop, you know, obviously the great players they have on the Mavs, but his coaching style is just very unique. That's going to be interesting how that gels with Luka Doncic, <laughs> but that's another story. So you leave it up to each reader to determine is Jason Kidd, was he helpful in Giannis's development mentally? Because was the tough coaching necessary, do you think, for him to go from that European kid who, I don't know if he was super sure about himself, but he certainly wasn't tough on the court, to developing the, uh, the scowl and uh, the snarl and being the guy we know today. Do you think he'd be who he is today without Jason Kidd? I think that Giannis would definitely be a very, very good slash great player no matter which coach he had. But I for sure think that Jason was instrumental in developing him. I mean, there's so much more about their relationship than in this excerpt. This was actually an excerpt of an excerpt. Like this is not the full chapter nine, you know, we had to, so there's so much more that you'll see that answers that question. but. I just think Jason Kidd was the first person to realize that Giannis was so effective if he just goes to the basket. And it's so weird how he would change coaches and the, you know, Bud would try to pull him further back and make him a shooter. But Jason really was the first to correctly identify the fact that nobody can stop Giannis going downhill. And I give him a lot of credit for that. And the tough love and making him speak up in film sessions when he's uncomfortable really helped Giannis's leadership. And finally, I think Jason Kidd just realizing like you could be the next generation big man like you could handle the ball and go inside really was was good for Giannis to see that he could play so many versatile positions I just think that Giannis didn't always agree with Jason's tactics on how he got there and this was sort of around the time when the next generation big man was even coming into existence and everybody, it seems like every time any big would shoot a three, you'd hear, oh my gosh, the modern NBA. And sometimes you still hear that, even though it's been going on for like 10 years. Um, but it, what reading that really opened my eyes was like Jason Kidd doing things that were tough. And like that, some of the experiments with Giannis probably weren't going to work out. And, he, and Kidd and, and other coaches could play it safe. But instead, they were like, no way. And in, in a way, that kind of risked their own job because it's risking more losses, more turnovers, more embarrassing moments. And it kind of gave me respect for guys who took the time to develop Giannis rather than to play it safe. Yeah, I think that that is why I think Jason is just really old school. Not only for all the reasons you just outlined, but he wasn't afraid to sit him down and say, you're not playing tonight because you didn't practice with the intensity that I wanted from you. That's a very old school type of thing. That does not happen in the NBA, especially with your best player. So I just think that um, Giannis grew from that. You know, he did. And also he's had the, um, I don't know, it depends if you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage. He's had three head coaches in his NBA career. Like there's been a lot of different direction that he's been thrown in, you know? So he's he's just learned to be adaptable to whatever system and whatever his coaches want from him, which has helped him, I think. Right. What jump did you see this season that made him the finals MVP? I think he understood his powers. Um, you would see him trying to shoot threes early in the playoffs and it's just uh, collectively, nationally, we're all just like, no, don't shoot, just go to the basket. Um, understanding that if he just goes and goes full speed, nobody can stop him. So I think just understanding what is the most effective use of his length and his speed and then just like sheer sheer skill sheer dom some of the shots he hit some of the some of the angles with he, he caught the ball in stride that dunk I mean the leap is real but also Giannis has been this good I think a lot of people are seeing him for the first time um, but he has been so so steady for so long and it just all collided on the biggest stage it's amazing we forget that he was injured a mere two weeks ago <laughs> It's insane. I don't know how many people in the world could have their knee bend 30 degrees the wrong way. But then oh and he didn't finish out the Hawks series. That's OK. His teammates took care of it. But he was there game one of the finals. That was insane. Um, so let's talk about the actual process of writing the book, because this is your first book, right? And from what, from what I understand, you loved the process and you would like to just continue writing books, which is awesome. But yeah. how did you love it when even the Bucks, <laughs> even the Bucks, weren't willing to help you write this book? When this is kind of a an ode to the city of Milwaukee and to the team. I mean, what what is up with that? I I anecdote. 
I covered the Spurs. I worked in San Antonio, uh, local TV, and it almost yeah. seemed like the smaller the market, where they're the big fish in the small pond, that's the attitude they take. The Thunder, the Spurs. Is that kind of <laughs> is that kind of how the Bucks work? Yeah, I don't understand it for the life of me because it's clearly a positive book, and uh, I have a, a you know a clear track record of, of profiling. NBA stars, including their own, you know, I profiled Giannis before I wrote this book. So God knows, I think that's, a, I don't know, uh, it's a question for them, but um, it really is a love letter to the Bucks and the city of, of Milwaukee. I love it because no matter what obstacle is in my way, whether it's somebody not giving me access or, you know, whatever obstacle there is, casual pandemic while you're trying to write a book. Um, <laughs> it, I just love the process of trying to report and write and find out new human facts about an athlete you know when I watch them on on TV and in games I'm always thinking like I wonder how they got here I wonder who their parents are I wonder you know did they like basketball at first when did they fall in love with basketball like I'm just so curious about all of these human aspects and so for me I just I just love being a reporter so even though it was really challenging just writing a book during a pandemic and, and dealing with things out of my control, you know, it's there's nothing like making a call and getting a great Giannis story after spending four hours on the phone with one of his best friends and just that feeling of accomplishment that you get after just doing the work, you know, the joy is in the doing. Did you actually get to talk to Giannis for the book? Yeah, so I... As I just mentioned, I profiled Giannis and his youngest brother, Alex, for Bleacher Report, which is where I used to work in 2019. And I spent the whole day with them at their house and I interviewed Giannis and um, we spent time at the Bucks facility. And so this book is born out of that. And so you'll see all the Giannis quotes from that, the ones especially that I didn't use from the story in the book now as well. And um Right before the pandemic, actually in late February 2020, I flew to Milwaukee, even though I hadn't signed the book deal till mid-March because, you know, it's my first book and I wanted to do a good job. And I was thankful to interview the family again um, in February, Costas and, and Thanasis and Alex. And um, yeah, and then the world was like, actually, you're not going anywhere. You're not going to Greece. Um, so I just spent the, re the rest of my time here uh, in my apartment. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what it would be like doing a lot of that stuff on Zoom. But, you know, I wonder what is that like when you're interviewing them and, you know, the difference between, and I try to kind of explain this to fans, the difference between like team media and the outside media is that team media will always write the positive angle. They'll never write anything critical. Um, what was that like and what were some of maybe the line of questioning or the storylines that you might have tried to dig into that you think maybe that in-house media wouldn't have been comfortable with doing? Was there any sort of line of questioning that you knew would be a little contentious? Well, one of the aspects of Giannis's narrative that's often swept under the rug is the racism that he experienced in his childhood and the racism that he still experiences now in Greece. Even as a national hero to that country, there are still murals of him being desecrated right now. So um, that is something he does not talk about at all very much. Uh, the book actually charts how he's getting a little bit more vocal about those experiences as he gets older. And um, I think because Giannis's story is such a, you know, it's been labeled a fairy tale. That's just a, a section of his life that, you know, maybe he isn't comfortable talking about. And so this book, I think, I hope is is really the first to just explore that in a really nuanced way that, that shows that, yes, there were so many kind Greek white people that helped him and gave him food and love and support. And then there were also a lot of people that were racist and did not treat him well. So I hope that people can see the nuance of that when they read the book. The reason why I want you guys to go read this book and get this book is it's not just like that 60 minute story that we know about Giannis where it's him selling the trinkets on the side of the road. And that's a great story. This is actually like, people who watch this channel aren't just casual basketball fans, they're diehards. This is also the story of like, in practice, Giannis becoming Giannis. Not just the Disney movie. Like this is actual like X's and O's basketball. So you guys will love it. Um, love the interview. Mirren Fader, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. That was wonderful.